Uh, I'd like to call a meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee back to order. It is Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, and our evening session is devoted to um, different policy bills from the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health. And our first bill on the agenda is Senator Hoffman, Senate File 4474. Mm, thank you, Chair Wicklin and members, Senate File 4474. I have a little A1 amendment that's an author's amendment. The, it adds two additional dental coverage conforming changes. I move the A1. Senator Hoffman moves the A1 amendment. All Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Madam Chair, it is also my understanding that there's a subsection in here that's, uh, if so be it, it could end up going to, uh, we would move this to human services if that's the case. However, um, I'm willing to make a deal right here if you want to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I can waive it. Can I? Do I need to do that in a formal way that it can stay within your jurisdiction? No, Anna, I, I mean, I think fine. if that's, if you accept, if that is acceptable, then we will just lay the bill over when we when you finish then. Well, yeah. That sounds, that sounds, I'm okay yeah. with that. S S Senator Rutke, I think he's the other one that's on our committee. Senator Mann, too, if they're okay to that, I'm fine with that because it stays within the jurisdiction. We're good. Um, Senator Wicklin, Madam Chair, that it's a this health care administration policy bill, it's just primarily technical and there's some clarifying changes. Um, specifically the medical assistance in the Minnesota care programs and Ann Bops from the department is here to talk us through the bill and to really answer the technical questions or anything you want on, on doing that. But with that, let's get our fluoride varnish in, in order and smile as we have a conversation, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Ms. Bobst, if you want to introduce yourself for the record and please begin. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, I'm Ann Bobst. I'm with the Department of Human Services. I'd like to thank Senator Hoffman for carrying this bill. As he mentioned, Senate File 4474 is our health care administration policy bill. Uh, so I'll just provide a brief walkthrough of the bill, and then I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, section 1 makes a technical clarification to, or correction to clarify the intent of language passed last session to limit the circumstances in which an overpayment of state-funded medical assistance in Minnesota care can be collected through judgment by operation of law. Section 2 repeals the medical care surcharge fund report. This is a technical report that is not used for any internal decision making, nor do we believe it's used for external decision making. Section three clarifies in statute that state and federal tax credits, rebates, and refunds are considered excluded income and excluded as assets for 12 months after the month of receipt when determining MA eligibility for people who are age 65 or older, blind, or disabled. This aligns with current policy and practice. Section four clarifies in statute that the asset verification system, or AVS, is used to verify assets, not specifically unreported accounts. Section five corrects a cross-reference regarding the recuperative care room and board rate based on other statutory changes that passed in 2023. Section six clarifies that the family planning rate increase that was passed in 2023 applies only to community clinics, which aligns with other rate increases in the section and the fiscal note for this change. Section seven cleans up a cross-reference in Minnesota care statute related to the 2023 dental coverage expansion. And finally, Section 8 allows recovery notices regarding the probate of estates to be sent to the commissioner via electronic means in addition to first class mail. Uh, and then in the A1 amendment, um, the first section of the amendment just clarifies a cross-reference related to dental coverage. And the second part of the amendment um, clarify, or removes dentures from the statute regarding eyeglasses, prosthetic, and orthotic devices. This is covered under our dental benefits, so we just wanted to clean that up for clarification in statute. Does not change the coverage policies. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions about Senate File 4474? No questions. Um, Senator Hoffman, any final comments? Thank you, Madam Chair and members, for hearing this wonderful, smiling bill. I hope we can, uh, you're going to lay it over, right? Correct. No need, no need for it to go to my committee, so thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, Senate file Thanks, 4474 is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. 
Next, we have Senate File 4448, Senator Bolden. And, yeah, and Christy Graham is here. Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is a DHS policy bill that makes changes to the medical assistance, behavioral health, home benefit, and housing support programs. The bill also includes some cleanup language to remove obsolete provisions in the general assistance statutes. DHS has vetted this bill with community partners and the modifications in this bill are fairly straightforward. They are intended to ensure people are at the center of mental health program processes and that housing support provider processes are simplified and un unambiguous. Uh, the department is here to walk through each section and help answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Graham, please state your name for the record and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair members. My name is Christy Graham. I'm here with the Department of Human Services. Um, similar to Ms. Bobst, I'll just walk through each section of the bill and uh, do a brief overview and then stand for any questions the committee might have. So sections one and two are related to the behavioral health home um, benefit. So this is a care coordination um, type benefit that serves people um, and children who have pretty serious mental health issues. So it's serving them across various aspects, including mental health, substance use disorder, physical health. Um, and this particular uh, change is two parts. So it's making a change related to um, how an individual needs to consent to, to receive these services. Um, so right now there's a requirement that consent needs to be um, written to receive these services. Over the course of the pandemic, um, we had um, some flexibilities to allow people to receive services either by consenting um, telephonically or electronically. Um, and that was really helpful for providers in terms of really making sure that that service is person-centered, that they're meeting people who are oftentimes experiencing really chronic health issues where they're at. Um, and so this, this particular provision would make that change so that people can also um, consent to receive services telephonically and electronically. And then also as part of um, this particular provision, we are streamlining some of the provider requirements. So right now in statute, um, there's a requirement that behavioral health home providers utilize what's called the um, DHS partners portal to be able to um, identify past and current treatment or services to really improve the care coordination that the individuals are receiving under this benefit. Providers have come to us and let us know that that, um, that particular tool is not really helpful. It's based on claims data, which has um, up to about a three month lag. And so um, this provision would change um, the requirements so that we can allow providers to use other tools and there's one in particular that they've identified. Um, so we'll be hope, hoping to offer that flexibility as part of this change. Um, section three is related to general assistance, um, uh, basically changing an effective date that was uh, erroneous last session. So last session there was a significant investment in general assistance, which um, we're very, very grateful for. It was historic investment. Um, and that is effective October of 2024. I'm sorry, yeah, October of 2024, so this next October. Um, and there was there's a couple parts in general assistance, the statute where the effective date is listed and one of them had the wrong effective date for 2023. So this change just modifies the effective date to align with the spreadsheet. Um, sections five and six are related to housing support. Um, um, budget neutral transfer. So this is sort of like a mini recodification or reorganization of the budget transfer um, part of statute right now. Maybe I'll back up. So housing support is funded through two ways. Either there's direct payments that go right to a vendor or a provider um, on behalf of a specific individual. Um, another way to get funded for housing support is to um, utilize what's called budget neutral um, transfers. And those are essentially a lump sum payment that goes to the provider. These transfers usually happen with um, emergency shelters and programs that are serving really transient populations where it's just easier for them to be able to keep their doors open and not have a leg in payment um, when someone leaves and they need to fill a bed right away. Um, and so we've got those cost neutral transfers are outlined in two different places in statute right now and they have various um, requirements. And so this change would just align all of the requirements in one area of statute, making it clear for providers what the expectations are, making it clear for the department um, how to enforce uh, the expectations. Section seven is just a renumbering of the general assistance statutes um, uh, related to a repealer that I'm about to cover, um, which brings me to the final section, section eight, um, which is just repealing some obsolete provisions related to the poor relief program, which is an antiquated um, obsolete program that um, uh, is related to um, before we had cash assistance programs, before we had the Social Security Act, um, counties would essentially um, 
uh, put people that were living in poverty, put widows, people with disabilities, people with mental health issues um, on farms to work, and that's how we would um, take care of them in this state. Program is obviously no longer running, um, but we have some references to it in the general assistance statute, so we're just repealing those references. And that's the totality of my bill, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, going over the uh, the bill. It, you 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 went over all the pieces I had marked, but just for a little more clarification, when it had the written consent, and you said now we can do it electronically because of what we've done the last couple of years, you are able to know that the person on the other end is who they are. I mean, because this is the initial sign up, um, so you're you're completely satisfied with that we've got that right person on the other end of the uh, electronic transmission. Ms. Graham. Madam Chair, Senator Aki, it's my understanding that individuals do have to, you know, substantiate their, their identity. Um, this is really just to get services started. If there was some kind of finding that a person was misrepresenting themselves or saying they were someone that they weren't, that those would be, um, those claims would be subject to, uh, you know, take backs. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. I was just uh, kind of wondering how the details work, so thanks. Any other questions? Well, I, seeing none, um, Senator Bolden, uh, this bill, this will also be laid over, I guess, so um, if you, if no other questions are um, uh, possible here that members have, thank you for the overview, and um, Senate file, 4448 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And next, Senator Bolden has Senate file 4618. And this one, I believe, does have an amendment. And, uh, oh, okay, it has an amendment that is not in our packets. And, or, oh. Do you know if, um, is this an amendment that you want to, to discuss right away, or do you want to talk about the bill first? Uh, Madam Chair, um, either way is fine with me. We could talk about the bill first and then uh, go to amendments. I actually have three amendments, but oh, okay. we'll, we'll be brief. Uh, well. Uh, please proceed then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I will be brief in my introduction as well. This is uh, the uh, DHS um, Office of the Inspector General Policy Bill, um, which uh, incorporates sort of five general areas for certifi certified child care centers. Uh, it discusses definitions of some age categories, uh, requirement for child care records. It talks about training timelines. It, there's some clarification around the language for a director or designee. There's a section on non-compliance, and then there's some technical clarifications. And so uh, for more details uh, and any questions members have, I will uh, turn it over to uh, our testifier. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, members, uh, my name is Ari Didion. I'm the Acting Legislative Director for the DHS Office of Inspector General. Um, and so this bill is related to uh, OIG uh, child care and children's issues related to child care and uh, child foster care. Uh, it includes uh, several proposals. Uh, one is a proposal to uh, update certified child care center policy. And this, uh, this proposal contains five components. Uh, it updates the definitions of age categories and requirements for child care records for certified centers. It adds a requirement that centers must keep a record for each child enrolled at their program, and it outlines what minimally must be kept in that file. It also adds age categories to the definitions in statute. Currently, the ages are only outlined in the group size and ratios portions of statute. The proposal also uh, edits training timelines. Uh, it adjusts the child development, first aid, and CPR training timelines for staff from within the first 90 days of employment to within 90 days after the first date of direct contact with a child. Um, and this was based on uh, some certified centers 
uh, work on like a, a school year basis, and so they might be doing their hiring during the academic year, but might not have staff starting until the summer, for example, and so we wanna make sure that uh, this aligns with those timelines and that folks are getting their training within 90 days of contact with children in the program. Uh, the bill also uh, clarifies the role of the designee uh, in a director's absence for certified child care centers. Um, additionally, the bill outlines uh, the, the ability for DHS to issue a conditional certification when there are issues of non-compliance. Uh, currently, the only actions that uh, DHS licensing has are for our correction orders, which is more of a, you know, kind of minimal action. Although, and then the other option we have is decertification. So the conditional certification allows us for kind of a middle option so we don't have to uh, go all the way to decertification for, um, for something that rises above a correction order. And then it adds a couple of technical clarifications um, to the certified center statute. It adds a definition of authorized agent for certified centers. Um, this was added to 245H01, but a conforming change is needed to background studies statute for this. And then it also allows for a finding of a non-maltreatment mistake in certified centers. Um, so we have this for other programs, but certified centers were unintentionally omitted when that change was made. Uh, additionally, this bill contains a, a proposal to clean up statute for uh, licensed child care centers. Um, and so this cleans up uh, from a proposal that was passed in 2023 that modified a uh, child care inspection statute from at least annually to at least once each calendar year. This passed last year, but the change was admitted from 245A.09 subdivision seven for licensed child care centers. So this just corrects that. Um, additionally, a 2020 change that passed uh, changes the definition of supervision in a child care center. Uh, to allow a preschooler to use an individual private restroom uh, as long as staff are appropriately supervising. Um, and then a conforming change is needed to 245A.66 subdivision two uh, that requires centers to have policies and procedures in their risk reduction plan to ensure that that supervision is taking place uh, when a preschooler is using an individual private restroom with the door closed. Additionally, this uh, contains some changes for uh, private child caring placing agencies, so uh, agencies that oversee adoptions. Uh, there's two components. One component is the financial oversight component, which requires private child caring placing agencies uh, to submit a certified financial audit each year upon license renewal, the proposal replaces the financial audit requirement with a yearly financial review conducted by uh, an accountant. Uh, and this was based on some provider feedback that smaller providers uh, sometimes struggle with the certified audit requirement because procuring a certified financial audit can be very expensive for organizations. Uh, additionally, this bill updates personnel requirements for child caring placing agencies. Uh, current statute requires that these agencies have a licensed independent social worker or independent clinical social worker on staff to supervise the agency's casework. Uh, we've heard especially from providers in rural areas and in, in greater Minnesota that this requirement can sometimes be difficult to meet. So this replaces this requirement with um, with outlining in statute the requirements for an individual who supervises the agency's casework. Um, and then this also has some family child foster care changes. Uh, the bill implements a <laughs> continuous license process for family child foster care license holders. Right now, after one year, if an initial one year license is issued for family child foster care license holders and then they renew on a two year cycle and are required to submit a new application each time they renew. Relative family child foster care license holders 
re receive an initial two-year license, and then they must complete the same renewal paperwork. This proposal switches family child foster care to a continuous license process that um, rather than reapplying each year, uh, providers would just update information annually. Um, and so maintaining a continuous license, this is something that we've implemented for other license types. Uh, and so this is also kind of aligning with those changes. And then the last component of this bill uh, is related to uh, CCAP, Child Care Assistance Program, Program Integrity. Uh, this change uh, makes clear that if somebody makes a report, makes a, submits a tip about um, an issue in a, in a child care program that is utilizing CCAP, that their identity would be kept confidential. And this aligns with Medicaid investigatory practices uh, and then just ensures that somebody can submit a good faith tip without having to worry about their identity being exposed. Um, and that is all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so, Senator Bolden, uh, how would you like to go th or proceed with the amendments? Um, I'm Madam Chair, I, we can go one by one. I would offer the A1 amendment. Okay. Um, Senator Bolden the, offers the A1 amendment. Um, do you want to describe? I'm it? happy to describe okay. it, yep. Uh, I will say this uh, came uh, from a child care provider uh, and it is around water bottles. And as I look, many of us have water bottles ourselves. Uh, the current statute does, uh, requires child care centers to be the only ones who can wash uh, cups and water bottles for kiddos who are aged 18 months to five years. For infants up through 18 months, um, parents can wash them and bring them back and forth. And for kiddos five or greater, the same, but for the time frame of 18 months to five years, the statute currently says that that has to be done, that the child care provider has to keep them and be the only one to do that. So um, simple language change that would just allow the parent to be able to take the water bottle back and forth to wash it as well as we think about all of the things that child care providers are responsible for and um, you know depending on how many kids they have in the center this could be very cumbersome and so um, allowing for if they choose to do so for parents to wash the, the water bottles as well okay thank you members do you have any questions about the uh, the a1 amendment senator abler well, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And I, uh, Senator Bolden, I, was this a hard-fought compromise with the department? Um, uh, Senator Bolden. Madam Chair, uh, no, the department is neutral on this issue. Thank you. Senator Madam Abler. Chair, you know, we've been on this committee for a long time working on child care. Um, you know, just <laughs> seriously. <laughs> we have to pass a law to say that mom can wash her dad. So could a brother maybe watch this as well? Is, is that an amendment we should make? Um, I just, I wish I knew how many of these little things are in law that are driving our child care providers out of business just by, because I think this could have been a citation if somebody discovered that someone's little brother was washing out their cup and bringing it in. So I'm happy you're doing it, but, um, to everybody in this committee, we've been trying to simplify this world, and I don't know how we missed this one, but I like, thank you for thinking of it. But to the department, could you please, in your obsolete bill, bring forward like 100 of these things that do not matter? We have child care worker companies that cannot find workers. We have people who can't find child care. It costs a lot of money, and um, even no matter how much money you throw at it, still it's too expensive. And so this would be a way to, a way to go. This is a wonderful amendment. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Any comments? No? Uh, well, members, um, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A2 amendment. 
uh, and I'm happy to describe it. Um, this is related to the definition of, again, we're talking about child care providers, uh, related to the definition for financial misconduct or misconduct. Um, currently, the definition reads that it is an entity's or individual's acts or omissions that result in fraud and abuse or error against the Department of Human Services. And so certainly, uh, misconduct uh, and fraud, we absolutely want to um, be able to detect and uh, you know take appropriate action on, but error is sort of a different a different space in my view, um, and that should be dealt with also, but to have it be in the same category as fraud, um, you know, something that is uh, intentional is different than a, um, uh, an, an error, uh, and so just looking to have that looked at differently. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Any questions? Um, um, does the department have any, want to make any comment about? Madam Chair, members. Uh, Mr. Dean? Uh, I'll have our Deputy Inspector General for Program Integrity speak to that. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. And Madam Chair, members, my name is Tom Johnson. I'm the Deputy Inspector General for the Program Integrity Oversight Division at the uh, Department of Human Services. Please go ahead and answer the question. Or, I mean, I, I guess you were going to offer your opinion on the amendment. Madam Chair, members, uh, thank you. Yes, we saw the amendment just this evening before the hearing, had a brief conversation with a uh, person representing the stakeholders who brought this forward, and we are certainly open to talking about that. What we need to, I need to take back and figure out is with this amendment, how would it impact the work that we do and that we're required to do by the federal government, the Office of Child Care? which gives us the uh, uh, child care block grant uh, money, and there's some requirements that come along with that. So certainly open to discussing it. We don't totally understand how this would impact our work, and we need to figure that out. Okay. Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Abler. Let me help you out. Um, so there's something people do on purpose by intentionality, and there's some things that just happen because you carried the four wrong. Uh, there were child care providers that were serving 100 kids, except there were none there. That's abuse and fraud. There's some people that counted 99 instead of 100, or the other way around, and just did a little math there. It's just, there was no one, well, actually, we're all pretty interested in having no abuse and fraud, and I made a big thing out of it over the years. So just so you know, for, for one voice, I'm on board with going after people who are doing wrong things with a conscious volition. If there's an error, then go help them correct it, take back the money. Thank you. Um, I also uh, met with uh, providers about who had concerns about this, um, the word error. Um, it does seem like it, it causes, um, it can cause a lot of uh, work and issues and there's not um, the ability for providers to, you know, if they make an error, this can be a very, you know, traumatic or investigation process, it seems like, and it's for an error. I guess I would like, I would like to see that, you know, that we investigate um, this very thoroughly and determine, you know, if we can't do it, if we can't remove this. Um, I guess, Senator Bolden, what is your um, pleasure in terms of how we proceed tonight with this amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the discussion and appreciate the collaboration with the department. Um, you know, I think, as we have heard, that investigations can sometimes start from tips, and we want to be sure that the resources at the state are really being focused on that abuse and fraud, um, and that, you know, an, an error really is a different category. And so um, I do want us to continue to work on this and um, appreciate that commitment to do so. And so with that, I, I would withdraw the amendment and um, hope that we can uh, get there uh, after some work. Okay. Um, thank you, Senator Bolden. Uh, I would encourage you to work diligently on this to see if we can come to agreement on, you know, this being uh, something that we can move forward with this session. Um, I do think the, the providers I talked to, you know, were not, um, they didn't have financial misconduct or um, fraud or abuse, but they had concern, had issues with an error, and I, it just seems like it should be a separate, as Senator Abler said, should be a separate uh, matter. So, 
Um, thank you, and thank you for testifying. Um, Senator Bolden. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. One more, members. I would move the A3 amendment, uh, which was at the suggestion of DHS. Senator Bolden moves the A3 amendment. Um, Ms. Didion, did you want to just talk about the amendment? Madam Chair, uh, members, this uh, amendment includes uh, just a couple, uh, just some items that were missed uh, on our previous reviews with the revisers draft. Uh, I don't think that any of these should be particularly controversial, but I'm willing to answer any questions. Members, do you have any questions about the A3? So Senator Bolden moves the A3 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A3 amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden, anything else? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I just am going to back up to the A2 for a second. And this one is, comment is for the department. Um, something like this and we have to talk further about it doesn't make sense at all but it goes back to the challenges we have out there we all know that the shortage of daycare providers and the availability of daycare across our state is our number one economic driver because we don't have adequate daycare we aren't able to um, get those additional people in in for employment and it's it's hurting us everywhere um, I just asked for some common sense from the department because I've got providers up in my area that get harassed about their, their license because of ridiculous things. And I know that some of those things are monitored by the counties, but I ask that you work with them and put in a big dose of common sense because um, I can think of a couple providers that are no longer open that were doing a terrific job and they went above and beyond to help their families out, and they get reprimanded for it. And uh, we just can't have that because we just don't have enough already. Uh, just please do what you can to support those providers rather than make their life miserable. Thank you. Any other member comments? Seeing none, this bill does need to be um, referred to the Judiciary Committee. Um, so, Senator Bolden um, moves that Senate File 4618, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Members, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The, uh, Senate File 4618, as amended, is passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Ms. Didion. I guess you are on the next, or up for the next bill as well. Senator Mann has Senate File 4662. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate File 4662 is the anti-kickback Bill, and I think the department will be the first to tell you that it is not quite where it should be, uh, but I'm going to let him talk about it. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Didion. Please proceed. Madam Chair, uh, again, Ms. Uh, Ari Didion, uh, the legislative uh, acting ledge director for the DHS Office of Inspector General. Uh, this proposal, it has uh, two components. It prohibits kickbacks in both the CCAP program as well as under medical assistance. Um, and so this proposal would create penal criminal penalties for individuals and entities that knowingly and willfully, willfully offer to pay, solicit, or receive compensation uh, where payment may be made under a healthcare program or a CCAP program. Uh, so kickbacks are already prohibited under for Medicaid under federal law. The CCAP component would be new. Uh, the feds don't have a CCAP policy. Uh, so this proposal came out of discussions um, 
with some of our uh, state and federal uh, law enforcement partners, as well as some things that our investigators had been seeing uh, when looking into uh, looking into fraud, waste, and abuse in programs. Uh, some examples of ways that uh, kickbacks can impact uh, healthcare is it can lead to overutilization, increasing program costs, uh, and it can corrupt the decision making. And additionally, uh, under under Medicaid, uh, there's a potential for abusive or fraudulent billing, uh, which risks uh, harm to participants as well as um, just. Medicaid funds not being used for the appropriate reasons, uh, and similar concerns with the CCAP program. So this proposal would align a Minnesota statute with federal anti-kickback law for medical assistance. The CCAP language is modeled after uh, Wisconsin, who has a anti-kickback uh, statute for CCAP. Uh, Additionally, the Medicaid portion, we worked with the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit and the Attorney General's Office on this language. Uh, in Minnesota, under for MA, fraud cases are prosecuted by the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Uh, for CCAP, these cases are uh, investigated by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I see an A1 amendment. Is that something that you'd like to talk about or is that uh, something you'd like to adopt? Tonight? We would like to adopt the Madam Chair. We're gonna talk about okay. it. Madam Chair. Ms. Didian. The, uh, the A1 amendment uh, strikes a couple of references to chapter 119A that was just a holdover from earlier drafts of the language. We determined that that, that wasn't necessary for the CCAP portion. We just need the reference to 119B. So we're striking those references. Members, any questions about the amendment? Senator Abler. Well, and you know, certainly we're against, you know, fraud and, you know, less, less worried about errors, I bet. But um, so these are, um, I'm just curious, I mean, I, it must be a thing if you're worried enough to bring it around. But, um, so practically speaking, uh, in a time when uh, there's just not a lot of law enforcement around to enforce a whole lot of laws, what would the, give, can you give an example of a practical application? Like, would this be following an investigation? You're, doing, you're gonna try to shut someone down anyway, like, like, the, like the fake child providers or something like that? I don't. I mean, I don't see the police going out to somebody's house and arresting them for getting a hundred dollar discount on their child care or something. Could that? Can you help me out, Ms. Didian? Madam Chair, so I typically, and I will ask our uh, Deputy Inspector General for Program Integrity to join me again. But typically, when we're hearing from our law enforcement partners about kickback cases. They are already investigating other allegations of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, and I will hand it over to Tom to elaborate. Thank you. Um, please state your name again for the record and begin your testimony. Madam Chair members, Tom Johnson, Deputy Inspector General at the Department of Human Services for um, with the Program Integrity Oversight Division. Um, yes, what Ari said is correct. Um, Basically, we are seeing in our investigations and hearing from our state and federal law enforcement partners that kickbacks are actually happening. Um, in the Medicaid world, those kickbacks are already illegal at the federal level, but there's nothing in the state law that prohibits them. It doesn't allow us as an administrative agency to take administrative action against providers that are doing them. And if we think there's actual criminal activity going on with kickbacks, we can't refer them to our state laws for enforcement partners, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for Child Care Issues and the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit at the Office of the Attorney General for Medicaid. So I could give you some examples of what we're hearing about, if that would help. One example. Um, yeah, one, one example one, is... Just a, just a random example absolutely, would be helpful. Yes, and I, I'm not going to... I don't yeah. want to be here all night either, yeah. Madam Chair, but just a, an example of something without any names or anything, just what's going on lately. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, uh, Senator 
Fabler, an example that we're hearing about is with an adult, adult day center, so it's a licensed Medicaid service activity program, um, paying family members for the opportunity to serve uh, the, the person in their family who's receiving the services. So basically paying someone to come to you to, to, to receive services. In the best case scenario, they actually are providing services. Um, under federal law, that already is illegal. It's a felony, it's a kickback. Um, under state law, there's nothing that would prohibit it. In the worst case scenario, the provider is billing for services for that individual, but they're not actually providing services. We have the authority to investigate that for fraud, for billing uh, for services not actually provided, but we have no ability to take any kind of action or refer that case regarding the, uh, the kickback portion of that, uh, either administratively at DHS or refer it to our law enforcement partners. In this case, it would be to the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Madam Chair, that's actually really helpful. Senator Abler. Um, you know, just not for tonight, but it would be interesting to hear from, you know, I'm, I'm all about program integrity, and you have to balance it with reasonability, which is the, you know, the unintended thing we talked about, whatever that word was. Um, um, and, and so, uh, but it, could sometime you present, provide for us kind of like where the biggest cluster of fraudulent activities you see are? I can see in a, some of that adult day stuff that there could be some problems and there have been in the past. But just, it'd be interesting just to just see where the preponderance of cases are like here. We had some child care, like a few of those, and then a lot of these, and that, that would be, and, and I support your work, so make sure you get that the right way. So thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, absolutely, we can provide that summary data to you and the committee. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, any other, let's see, any other questions? Did, did we, I was thinking I'd, we didn't finish the adoption of the amendment, so let's complete that part. Uh, members, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. And now, any other questions about the bill or comments? Senator Mann? Madam Chair, um, I know that Senator Abler is big into program integrity. That's why I brought this. Um, but having said that, again, I think we need more conversations about this bill. So I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. Yes, this bill um, will benefit. It can go to judiciary for <laughs> that beneficial discussion. <laughs> um, that was what you were looking for, right? It's always what I'm looking for. So, um, your motion, Senator Mann, would be that Senate file 4662 as amended, or no, excuse me, yes, that's correct. Uh, Senate file 4662 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion does prevail. The Senate file 4662 as amended does pass and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. And now you have Senate file 4665. Thank you, Madam Chair. 4665 is a technical uh, bill that I will let our uh, professionals here talk about. Uh, Ms. Ms. Didion. Madam Chair, this is uh, the OIG uh, policy bill. So this contains um, several several changes to um, to various portions of statute re uh, under uh, OIG. Um, so sorry, kind of <laughs> losing my place here. Let me find my place again in my talking points. Um, so this contains um, several different uh, proposals. Uh, I'll just run through those really quickly. Some of these are pretty technical. Um, some of them are a little bit more substantive, but uh, overall kind of a clarifying proposal. Uh, 
So the first uh, set of changes relates to a uh, change of ownership process. Uh, in 2020, change of, there was a change of ownership uh, process added to DHS licensing statute. Um, as our folks in the licensing division were implementing this change, there were coming up with a lot of questions about how, how this should work. And so uh, this change clarifies the scenarios that are a change of ownership. Uh, it clarifies when a temporary license is applicable. Uh, it clarifies the responsibilities of the existing and new owners while operating under a temporary change of ownership license, and then it refines some of the terms related to a change of ownership process. Uh, the next set of changes are uh, related to uh, allowing for putting in conditions uh, while a provider well, a revocation order is under appeal. So DHS licensing utilizes uh, progressive actions when license holders are not meeting licensing requirements. The most serious cases might require DHS to revoke the license. Um, and when a provider appeals a revocation, they may continue to operate while under repeal. So what this change does is clarifies in statute that uh, DHS can put in place terms while a provider is operating under uh, appeal. So this currently statute is um, silent on this. It does not give us the authority to put in these conditions. The change uh, adds the authority for licensing to put in place terms, um, which would vary based on the violations that led to the revocation, but some examples of terms are the license holder being required to create a corrective action plan, uh, being required to notify clients of the revocation, or uh, limiting the admission of new clients while the revocation is under appeal. The next change is, uh, this is a pretty simple one, it just makes uh, the program emails for uh, DHS license programs public data with the exception of um, family foster care due to uh, privacy concerns. Um, we get a lot of uh, requests for, uh, particularly from other state agencies or even from within DHS uh, for this information. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that that's classified as public data. Um, we also, uh, we've met with uh, stakeholders on this one and um, we you know, wanna give that enough time for uh, folks to create, especially for, um, for folks like uh, family child care where they might be using a personal email address for their business to create a, a business specific license uh, before those become public. Uh, the next set of changes relate to uh, key staff position changes. Um, I will note that um, we did uh, meet with uh, MARTAP, the uh, Association of Rural Treatment Providers, they did uh, have some concerns about this uh, proposal, about this change. Um, and so we're happy to keep uh, discussions with folks about this. Uh, so the key staff changes uh, component, uh, license programs are required of for several DHS license programs, uh, programs are required to keep uh, certain key staff positions filled to ensure that the client's medical needs are being met, um, that staff are being supervised, and that all of the licensing requirements are being followed. Uh, the requirements vary by license type. But some of these uh, can include the treatment director, program director, uh, nurses, mental health professionals, uh, licensed alcohol, alcohol and drug counselors, and a medical director. So DHS licensing has found during licensing reviews that some programs were leaving key staff positions vacant for several months. So this proposal uh, attempts to address that by requiring programs to notify DHS of uh, a change in one of these key, key positions within five days. Uh, and this change would apply to um, substance use disorder treatment programs, withdrawal management, uh, 
detox programs and uh, children's residential facilities. The, propose, the change mirrors requirements that are already in place for intensive residential treatment services and residential crisis services. The next set of changes uh, relate to off-site uh, substance use disorder treatment services. So generally, DHS licensing standards require substance use disorder treatment to be provided at the location where the program's license is issued, uh, with the exception of some services that may be provided off-site because the type of service needs to utilize community settings. Some settings might include therapeutic rec, stress management, independent living skills, employment services, uh, and educational services. So in order to provide these specific services off-site, the license holder must create a multiple policies and procedures that detail each and every offsite location. 2018 changes allowed uh, substance use disorder treatment programs to request to provide all treatment services at specific locations away from the licensed program site. Uh, these locations can include a school, government building, medical or behavioral health facility, or social service organization. And currently, in order to provide services at these locations, a license holder must receive approval for each and every location from the licensing division. What this proposal does is um, kind of clarifies this requirement by eliminating the requirement uh, to create policies and procedures for each location um, and also places some parameters around additional uh, service locations and limits on additional service locations. Uh, finally, this this set of changes clarifies the ability for programs to provide services via telehealth and in a client's home. And then uh, we also have some pretty technical fixes. Uh, this next set of changes mostly relate to items that passed in previous legislative sessions, um, mostly kind of statutory cross-references that were overlooked. Uh, there's a, a, cha a change in 2023 passed uh, establishing a requirement for several types of substance use and mental health programs to maintain a supply of emergency overdose medication like naloxone or Narcan. Uh, however, as uh, we've been implementing this, uh, we noticed that previously existing requirements for medication storage and administration conflict with some aspects of this new law. So what this proposal does is al allow staff and adult clients to carry emergency overdose medications. It allows naloxone to be readily available at the program and not locked up with other medications and allows staff to be trained on um, only administering emergency overdose medications. Um, typically staff are required to go through specific training for medication administration and this would just allow them certain staff members to be only trained for administering emergency overdose medi medications. There's also a couple of changes related to family child care. Uh, in 2023, um, there were some updates related to uh, updating a state licensing statute to the uh, fire code. There are just a handful of provisions that, uh, a couple of changes that still needed to be made, and so those are included here. Uh, there is the addition of um, some missing ref references for community residential settings. Um, and then there are some updates related to uh, uniform service standards, which was uh, passed by the legislature in 2021. Um, and as those changes have started to take effect, um, these were consolidations um, and streamlining of the mental health statutes. And um, as we've been, uh, as those have been going into effect and been talking with the community, um, we've found a need to clarify some wording and clean up some of the language uh, based on these discussions and uh, implementation concerns. And then uh, in 2023, uh, there was a change related to uh, banning prone and contraindicated restraints. Uh, there's a, the addition of a missing cross-reference that uh, didn't get changed when that passed. Uh, there's a change to uh, state licensing requirements for opioid treatment programs that uh, conforms with uh, federal rules. There is a 
change related to the implementation of the provider licensing and reporting hub that the licensing division uh, is currently in the process of implementing this change would require requests for reconsideration uh, for uh, findings of maltreatment to be submitted through the provider licensing and reporting hub. Um, and then finally, there were changes uh, made, I believe in 2023, related to certified community behavioral health clinics. Um, and this corrects some of those references. Uh, one of the changes allowed uh, substance use disorder comprehensive assessments to be substituted to fulfill the requirements of a comprehensive evaluation. Um, CCBHCs are federally, federally required to complete a comprehensive evaluation within 60 days of the request for services. Um, this provision ensures that those federal requirements are met. And actually, as I'm reading that, out loud, I do believe that the um, author's amendment strikes those provisions, so I scratched that portion. <laughs> My apologies. Um, there's also several changes related to GHS background studies. Um, there is a, ch a change that would allow DHS to authorize uh, an emergency name and date of birth background study uh, in a situation like what we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in 2020 when everything was shutting down, uh, fingerprinting locations where uh, background study subjects would go to get fingerprinted for a DHS background study were shutting down. Uh, and so DHS at that time had temporarily uh, authorized uh, the ability to use a name and date of birth study through a kind of a through emergency authority, this would just give us the ability to, to do that in the future if there was a, a similar situation that would require us to uh, go to those name and date of birth studies. There is also a set of uh, clarifications and uh, cleanup related to um, disqualifications for background studies. Uh, it makes two sets of changes to background studies statute uh, chapter 245C. The first set of changes clarifies uh, and ensures statutory consistency uh, with current operations and best practices. Uh, the second set of changes updates the list of disqualifications in 245C to um, conform with uh, expungement law and the criminal code and eliminates inconsistencies uh, in those disqualifications. And then there's another set of uh, changes related to DHS background studies that uh, updates chapter 245C to be consistent with federal requirements for similar types of background studies. Uh, so these changes create consistency um, in the requirements for um, foster care settings. Uh, so this would, um, prohibit the department from issuing a variance for an individual affiliated with a foster residence setting or a children's residential facility when the study results do not meet federal requirements for a child foster care and adoption, which are similar program types. Um, right now, state law prohibits the department from issuing a variance for these individuals, um, which is not in line with federal requirements. And so this just updates that and conforms with federal requirements. And then finally, the last change in here, uh, previously DHS chain, uh, added a requirement for uh, to use certified mail for, um, for certain uh, mailings. This just updates that to uh, expand the signature delivered methods that are available. So it would not just be certified mail, but like FedEx or UPS, um, just so that there are multiple options with that like signature verification. And that is all of the changes in this bill. Thank you. Um, I, there is an A1 amendment. Um, is there anything else you want to add about that, Ms. Didion? Uh, Madam Chair, this is largely items that were uh, missed on prior review. I will call out two items that are not, um, like I mentioned, the uh, CCBHC language, um, I believe that is 
page five, line 22, that is being removed. Um, we're in discussions with the advocates on that. Uh, that was not quite ready for prime time, so we're taking that out. And then additionally, uh, there's another new change, which would be on line, my apologies, related to the um, telehealth requirements for uh, substance use disorder treatment. Um, so we, on page 42, um, there's new language uh, related to telehealth. This, I, I would not call this compromise language. This is language that we generated based on feedback we were hearing that the statute and what we had existing in our proposal was not clear on telehealth. Uh, so this is an attempt to, to clarify that. Uh, but everything else is mostly items that we just missed on previous reviews of our drafts. Um, Senator Mann, did you want to move that as an author's amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, members, on the A1 amendment, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Members, are there any questions, comments about the bill? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, question comes from page 36 um, on line 22, when it just talks about the uh, seeking a child foster care license, and then it talks about if it's a relative that the background study disqualification could be set aside. Can you give me some examples of what might be set aside if it's a relative versus a non-related uh, person? Ms. Didion? Madam Chair, um, I'll ask our Deputy Inspector General for background studies to join me at the table too provide some examples. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record. And did you hear the question? Do you want him to repeat it or do you? Please proceed. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dawn Davis. I am the Deputy Inspector General for the Background Studies Division in the Office of Inspector General. And yes, please, could you repeat the question? Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and if, if you're looking up the language again, it's on page 36, um, starting with line 22. And again, it's the child foster care license requirements, but it, it specifies that if, if this is, if they're a relative of the child, um, the background study disqualification should be set aside. And I was wondering what kind of examples would be set aside because it's a relative versus someone who is not related. Ms. Davis. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I am phoning a, phoning a coworker on, a, on an answer to that for some examples. But I do understand that this is to uh, provide options for the family so that there can be a family member in the home. So if you... Madam on. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Mann. Yeah, so the, the whole um, section talks about when they can set aside this the disqualification and just saying as adding another provision saying that it's a it's a if it is a family member that's another reason to potentially set that aside that's it senator atkey is it is there someone else who has more information behind you ms didian Welcome to the committee. If you can state your name and answer the question. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Emily Kassane. I'm a policy analyst with the background studies and the authors of the Inspector General at DHS. I'm trying to think of examples as I was walking up, um, and I'm sort of drawing a blank, so I'll come up, I'll query and, and ask for some more. But the idea was to give, and ideas with similar to what Stavis had said, to give more um, 
options for keeping families together. Um, it wasn't to to be so rigid, but to give um, some more, I'm struggling with the word, the um, um, formal word, but just to give, so it's not a rigid set of rules, but to keep in mind the family, the kinship relationships um, when you're making the determination um, so that you know, we have more flexibility um, in making those determinations, but I'm happy to, to come up with some examples and share them with you. Mm -hmm. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, I would appreciate that if you, if you could follow up at a later time, mm -hmm. um, just because if it's something that's not right for a non-relative, why would it be right for a relative? And just to find out how minor those changes are, but I think there should be somewhere where that, that definition or the explanation sits. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Senator Abler. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Mann, thanks for carrying the bill. I've uh, done this, this particular topic quite a bit in the past, and it's actually really an important kind of a bill. And Senator Aki, the question about what to do with a relative, um, I've been trying to create flexibility in this area for, and have not been that successful. Uh, so back in 2005 was the Alejandro Rodriguez case and Drew Shadeen and um, Governor Plenty. We cracked down on crime uh, prior to that time. It was 2005, right around something like that, um, or seven. But, um, and so prior to that time, the commissioner, which had the authority to set aside disqualifications, had set aside 14,000 disqualifications people who should otherwise be disqualified based upon the letter of all these laws. And of that group, five people reoffended, which is actually lower than the incidence of people who are just normally going to cause a problem just out of the general population. And I think only two of those did something in the area of their, their set-aside, like somebody stole 20 bucks from a person in a nursing home and, and like that. So, um, so I, I think just to, the commissioner is very careful who they set aside because it, it's on their dime, so it's that point. Um, I have a bunch of questions about the bill, Madam Chair, if I may. Senator Abler. Um, so oh. well, let's just do I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I neglected. There's one more testifier. Oh, I'm Can, sorry. And I, yeah, I'm no, happy it's, to wait. It's I'm not my fault. If, um, <laughs> Matthew Bergeron, did you want to provide your testimony? And then, and then we can go to your questions, Senator Abler. I, yeah, sure. I apologize. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Senators. Uh, thank you for the time. My name is Matthew Bergeron. I'm a uh, health care and government relations attorney with the law firm of Larkin Hoffman, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Alliance of Rural Addiction Treatment Programs. It is a 501c6 association of rural substance use disorder um, and withdrawal management providers. Uh, I, I want to start by saying thank you to DHS staff. They, they have been in, in dialogue with us in the last uh, uh, handful of days, answering a number of questions, clarifying some things. And uh, I'll start by saying I haven't had the chance to uh, review the amendment that was just adopted as it relates to uh, telehealth. That was one of the concerns that uh, the rural substance use disorder providers had. And it was really about clarity in the language, less than it was about uh, intent and, and use of kind of conventional terminology when it comes to um, what's an appropriate uh, originating site, what's an appropriate distance site. Um, I think particularly for uh, rural providers with workforce issues, weather issues, infectious disease issues, the ability to use telehealth as fully as maybe we, we've grown to uh, recently is, is important. So look forward to reviewing that language and, and, and working on that going forward. Um, but the, one of the primary things I, I wanted to, to raise a little bit of a concern about today was um, the, uh, the proposal that would require a notice to the department within five days of certain staffing changes. Uh, I, my client fully understands the desire of the department to identify programs that maybe have gone without these key positions. Nobody's disputing that your you know, program director, your medical director is absolutely essential to running a compliant program and recognizing that if a program is operating with one of, without one of those positions filled in violation of their license for months at a time, that, that's a real problem. The concern comes in the concept that making everyone who's following the law submit this notice is going to somehow get after that. 
if, if a provider currently is willing to go multiple months without a treatment director or without a medical director, they're probably not going to submit a one-page form informing the department of their intent to do so. And so what this does is, as we've had a lot of conversation in both uh, um, this committee and in, in uh, the Senate Human Services Committee about paper redu per paperwork reduction, particularly in the uh, area of substance use disorder treatment, this feels like just an additional requirement on top of providers that are in compliance that may not actually get at the goal of identifying those who are operating uh, outside of the requirements of their, their licensure. Um, and it also creates one more thing that upon that licensure review, uh, failure to have provided one of these notices becomes something that could be dinged on a, on a license. And so uh, we've had good concern, good conversations with the department. I think there's some opportunities over the next uh, couple of months while uh, the legislative session progresses to look at other ways of getting at that goal of finding an earlier touch point with providers who maybe are, are uh, not appropriately staffed under their license. Um, but the, the current language in the bill is, is, is definitely a, a concern and, and seen as unduly burdensome. So thank you so much for the, for the time and the opportunity this evening. Thank you. Um, now, Senator Abler, did you have questions? Well, thank you. And, and I'm sure the department will consider that testimony in a careful way. Um, we don't want to make it harder. I mean, the, it, if, I'm sure you listened to our hearings. Um, we heard just on on Monday, no, on yesterday and what day is it? Uh, yesterday and the, yesterday we talked about the SUD providers that are just so collapsing personally with their own personal inability to serve the people who want to be served, the ones that are trying to stay open at rates that they can't even survive at. So uh, to the department and policy analysts and whoever in this department in particular, uh, the unintentional inca incapability of some people to provide some of the paperwork or some of the, you know, stuff that we'd like to have, um, where they're doing their best to serve, uh, is is a consideration that I hope that we can make in these laws. And we have to live in black and white laws, and it's hard to write a gray area. But I like that that ability to have some flexibility with a foster care. So like, so like, uh, there's a, a a nephew, and the brother dies in a, in a tragic accident. Now you get this other brother who's a little interesting of character or, you know, and he's had a past, but he loves his niece and they consider he actually is, it's been five years or 10 years since he was notably in trouble. Um, and the department says, I think this would be a good fit and, and they would check up on him and so that, that kind of thing where there's flexibility. Um, so just to encourage you about that, um, I, uh, have a, just a number of questions. I'll try not to take too long on them. But I notice on the, the 245C stuff, I've been trying forever to undo some of the ill effects of the laws that were changed. In the, and I, I like Governor Plenty. We're friends, pretty much. Kind of got it under his skin a few times. But anyway, but so we, we cracked down. We were tough on offenders at that point. And we had social, we had alcohol drug counselors that couldn't stay alcohol drug counselors. We had people that had gotten a promotion at one place, took the new job quit their job, couldn't pass a background check, then they had no job. And so we've been trying with, in a bipartisan way with Representative Lesh and others to some, somehow make this reasonably flexible so people who are still good people can have a second chance. Um, and so I know there was something done, I think we passed something last year on some of these second chance folks, I believe, um, to lower the, the permanent bars. Um, the, the crimes you're adding throughout, there's a, quite a variety of crimes. Are those kind of technical? I mean, it looks, looks like a big list. Can you just comment on all those new crimes that could, I mean, they look like they're bad crimes, but thank you, Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, thank you for the question. Uh, this actually is just to clarify. Um, it's clarifying language where uh, Crimes and conduct are showing up elsewhere in statute, but just had not followed over into 245C. So um, if you have one specifically that you want me to sort of no. point to, but that's really, it is clarifying, clarifying and cleanup and conformance. Um, we were also cognizant of uh, our ability not, or willingness not to sort of bring a whole treasure trove of new disqualifying 
um, crimes and conduct, uh, especially given the work that the task force, eligibility task force had went through and um, just really wanted to hone in on things that were of cleanup. Okay, Madam Chair. Senator, Senator And so Adler. after a while it becomes a blur, I have to admit, but so we did do some friendly things to people who deserved a second chance that were adopted last year, was it, or two years ago? Ms. Davis. Madam Chair, member of the members of the committee, uh, there were some. Uh, a few. That's hard to qualify to say we did do friendly things. Um, we did address some of the uh, inconsistencies in our statutes uh, in the background studies division. Uh, we also know that we are walking a, a fine line between federal program requirements as well as just the state program requirements. And so I'd have to understand more specifically if there are particular provider types. Well, thanks. And Madam Senator Chair, Abler. no one has talked to me lately, but I know there was a task force about trying to to reduce some of the relatively pointless disqualifications where the person is actually, would be a really good worker with, you know, a, a variance or a set aside or something. Anyway, just, I, I'm not gonna take too long, Madam Chair. I'm, on line 26.10 to 13, um, that section, that whole section that starts on page 25.24, that's disqualification from, disqualification from direct contact. Is that a permanent disqualification? And then you add a new one, but is that a permanent disqualification? Maybe Senator Mann knows. <laughs> that was it. Ms. Davis. Madam Chair, members of the committee, could I have just a moment? Madam Chair, members of the committee, the, <clears throat> the TPR is 15 years. That is the time frame. Not permanent. All right. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And so I just want to ask about um, on line 2610 that individual whose rights were terminated. Um, are you sure you want to go after some of those folks? There's a lot of reasons to terminate parental rights, like they voluntarily, they say, I'm, I mean, there's people who, that you arrest the child away because they're being, you know, terribly abused. And there's some people who just have had substance use issues and it went quick. Um, and with the 12 month goal, here, here's a, you know, a teen mother maybe who, um, or someone like that, or a teen father, or whoever, um, and they're, in five years, they're a whole different person. But now they can just never do this. And I just want you to think it through, if you will, and just say what you mean. But I don't know what you're solving with that. And I think you're gonna capture some people who are otherwise really qualified to do work. So I, you don't have to reply, just, just make a note of that. So I wanna ask a few more questions. I'm glad you're doing something with emergency ownership, um, where there could be some flexibility in that. And, the, the, tr the challenge of your agent, your department is, is integrity and then you wish you could be flexible, but and, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's a real hard balance and I get the knife edge a bit. Um, but in a time when there's no one to work in some of these nursing homes or in these, every center that we have, I hope that we can find a way to help people that are otherwise genuinely suitable and actually reinstate a more robust set aside program where they would scrutinize this individual, they'd make their case, they're disqualified, but you, if you're, we're gonna keep an eye on you so you could be the gardener, a landscaper at a nursing home and you can't really you know, be directly involved in the more intimate settings. Just a mm -hmm. thought for you. Um, and then um, just two more things. Um, I was, um, I'll save my amusing one for the end. Um, the background studies and the fingerprinting um, it's a mess. We could have 
I bet half the people in this audience would tell you it's not working. We need a better way. Is there not some way using that? Somebody told me how you could do it even using like a phone or something to do the background studies. Um, I've got an effort to try to create some more flexibility in creating a pool of people who have been background studied. Um, but it's a bottleneck. And the child care workers, I just have a friend who gave up on having a child care center. It was an amazing one. You would have loved it. Um, it was just it was a reduced rate and they help people with financial counseling. But to get a worker, you have to get it done quick, and then they have to, if they don't quite get there, they have to start over. And if you can even get an appointment in your neighborhood, and so across greater Minnesota, I'm sure Rep. Senator Rutke would tell you, it's a mess. You have to drive 50 miles to get a job that pays 18 bucks. And is there anything in here that makes it better? Ms. Davis. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senator uh, Abler, um, with the fingerprint vendor, um, we know that there are three fingerprint vendors who can handle the state of Minnesota. We've used two already, so we are at the last one. In this, in our proposals uh, right now, because they are policy focused, it does not uh, bring into uh, any proposal forward that would support or make changes to the fingerprint vendor. Okay, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I'm almost done, but I, I mean, these are, this is just really people's careers and opportunities in this bill, so I, I'm just, so I'm kind of a wonk on this one. I'm probably gonna be quieter on the rest, but um, could you please figure out a better way? There is technology, there's, there's, you have to buy the thing and it costs like $11,000 or something and no one has that kind of money, but there's other ways to get access to this that I can't remember, I'm not a tech wonk. If I was a weatherman, I'd probably know the answer. But, I, um, but so there's, there's a better way, and it's not working. And for the industry around that wants to serve people, it is, this is a huge burden driving good people from coming in an industry where they can't get enough in the first place. I can see you're eager to reply and go like, good idea, we'll get right on it. Maybe I'm Thank Ms. You, Ms. Davis. Davis. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, members of the committee, um, we are very much interested in becoming our own FBI channeler. Um, so there, there could potentially be an opportunity uh, with using a feasibility study to determine what that would look like for the department to become our own fingerprint you know, vendor, if you will, or fingerprint um, and, and have live scan devices that would go across the different counties to serve individuals. We know that that has been a struggle with the uh, two largest fingerprint vendors, and so that is something that we are eager to look into for sure. Thank you. And just Senator the last thing about fingerprints, mm -hmm. and I'm almost done. Um, the, um, and since this, I mean, these vendors, God bless them. But I'm just telling you, if you just stood in the hallway and say, hey, come talk to me about your fingerprint problems, uh, you would not get to go home until 10 o'clock. So it's not working. And it puts the programs at risk. And my final question is, I wasn't a particular proponent of legalization, but on the amendment on line 4.16, it's now a crime. People should know what they voted for. Anyway, so it's a... It's like a 15-year status uh, thing if you are in possession of cannabis in the first degree and you're selling it and cultivating it. So um, in this world where we're, uh, I'm concerned about, uh, deep, about some of this. I'm not a big fan of criminalizing. And now we're actually criminalizing so people can't work because they're doing what's halfway legal in town. Can you explain to me, is this like they had a truckload of, of pot and then they're trying to sell it? or? Um, but it seems like it's not the direction that we're going as a state. So do you have to really add that? Thanks. Ms. Dedean. <laughs> Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, I believe the changes related to um, cannabis possession in here are just conforming changes related on the changes to the criminal code that were made last year. Um, but we could certainly follow up and confirm that with you. Well, I think you want to talk Abler. to Senator Port about some of that stuff. And, you know, I, I just... I mean, I, I think it's a big deal. I'm really worried about what happens in middle schoolers smoking this stuff. And I'm just, I, I didn't win the argument. I wanted to be 25, but it's here. So um, it's gonna become more and more of a thing. So just caution you against harm. And just my last thought, as you dig into here again, it's really hard 
to pass any changes to any of these permanent bars, but if there's some language we could put in that gives the commissioner more authority to undo anything knowing that they're on the hook, that would help two, three, four thousand people a year probably that we desperately need. So that's, and actually if, if you're able to get me an amendment, I'd be happy to, to talk about that and with the advice and counsel of the good Senator Mann there on her bill. Thank you. Ms. Didion or Ms. Davis, did you have anything else to add? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I do want to just share with you, although there have been difficulties with a fingerprint vendor uh, providing statewide services, again, uh, we've used two out of the three national um, and international, actually, uh, fingerprint vendors that can serve a, an entire state. Um, and again, want to share with the members of the committee that we are eager and interested in looking into a feasibility study to determine whether or not it would be feasible for uh, DHS's background studies uh, system to become its own FBI channeler in our work with both the BCA and the FBI as well. Madam Chair, I told you I was almost done. Senator, you're I was done, but now I've just had a little <laughs> coda. Um, do you need language to ask you to go look into it? I'd be happy to work with Senator Mann to like tell you to please do that like tomorrow. Ms. Didion. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, uh, I think that a, a feasibility study like that would uh, likely have a cost, but if that's something that the committee is interested in, um, we would certainly be interested in that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll, I'll just make a note of it and we can see if there's anywhere we could put something like that, a request like that. Um, other, any other members have questions or comments about the bill? No? Um, well, Senator Mann, um, any other thoughts? Um, this bill also needs to go to the Judiciary Committee. <clears throat> and so, um, Senator Mann's motion would be to um, recommend that Senate File 4665, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Is, it, is that your motion? Oh, I guess it's going to have to be, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> the motion does prevail, and Senate File 4665, as amended, is referred, passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you very much for the, the discussion. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, and now I will uh, switch over and um, if Senator Mann, Senator Chair, and Senator Mann will chair for the bills that I have. Madam Chair, Senate File 4572, when you're ready, and you, do, you do have an A1 that's getting passed out right now, members. I can talk about it if you need me to. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I have Senate File 4572, and we do have the A1 amendment. If um, we could adopt that, and then the um, testifiers will talk about it. Motion to adopt the A1 amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Madam okay. Chair, this yes. bill, that has the word data in it. Does that now make this bill have to go to judiciary? Yes, too? it actually does. But I believe it I'll, does. We reconsider the vote on that last yeah. amendment and not even do it. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Wicklin, go ahead. Madam, Madam Chair, Senate File 4572 is the Children and Family Services Policy Bill. 
and it relates to, it contains policy, technical, and housekeeping updates to statutes related to child care, child welfare, economic assistance programs, and adoption records. And I, there are two people, um, testifiers, and I'm not sure um, how they want to divide the, the work, so I'll let them proceed. Whoever wants to go first. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jennifer Sommerfeld uh, with Department of Human Services. Um, so the bill before you is divided into four articles. Article one is related to child care. Article two is related to child welfare. Article three is economic assistance. And article four um, are conforming changes to adoption stat record statutes um, to make sure we can implement the law that was passed year regarding original birth records. So I'm going to just cover some of the highlights. Um, Article one includes um, some, a couple of policy and technical changes to our child care assistance program. Uh, the predominant piece is ensuring that providers who will be able to later this year uh, receive notices through the online um, licensing hub. They can receive those both by mail and electronically. Um, it's up to them. They can receive it just electronically, just by mail, or both. So we want to make sure we have the authority to do that in statute. Um, so that is primarily, those are in sections one through three and five. Article one, section four, simply corrects an effective date. Uh, last session, legislation was passed to allow uh, every licensed child care program with, um, that's licensed to receive an automatic one-star parent aware rating. There was supposed to be an effective date of July 1 of 2026. That was erroneously left out of the bill, making that effective July 1 of 2024, which is not implementable. So we worked um, with advocates and folks on that bill to make sure people are aware that that will, in fact, not be effective until July 1, 26, and have added that language to the bill. So that's Article 1. Any questions? Thank you, um, Ms. Sommerfeld. Uh, Mr. Dem, did you want to say anything? Oh, oh that was just Article so, 1, sorry. Oh, I, I apologize, Madam Chair. I stopped at the end of Article 1. Uh, article 2 is on child welfare, and um, the first section of this relates to an existing moratorium on uh, adult and child foster care licenses for settings uh, where the license holder does not live in the home. There is um, a moratorium on that right now. Unfortunately, that doesn't allow for the certification of facilities to serve um, children through the Federal Family First um, Prevention Services Act. So there are types of settings that need to be certified, um, and those would include um, caring for kids with complex needs, uh, with behavioral mental health care, substance use disorder, if they've been sexually uh, exploited or trafficked or at risk of that, or pregnant and parenting, um, and also who are preparing for independent living. So we want to make sure that those facilities are able to be certified. So we have pulled that type of facility out of the moratorium. Uh, the rest of Article 2, Sections 2 through 21, contain a variety of technical and housekeeping fixes for our child welfare statutes. Uh, um, I'll just highlight a couple of them. We're clarifying extended foster care payment procedures uh, for youth who are in supervised independent living settings, uh, including adding vendor payment options for youth who are at risk of financial exploitation. Uh, we have added some provisions to protect, uh, clarify protective supervision case plans and court review requirements and um, separating petition requirements and court process processes for transfers of permanent legal and physical custody. And that change was made because there's sometimes confusion about whether you can um, transfer permanent and legal physical custody to a parent, when really that is just intended to be for a relative caregiver of a child in foster care. And that's where I'll end Article 2. Madam Chair, for the record, Nick Dem with DHS. Uh, Members, Article 3 is economic assistance article. This begins on page 34 of the bill. And this contains technical corrections and updates related to the Minnesota Family Investment Program and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. There's six sections in this article, but really three separate proposals within those six sections. So I'll just group the proposals by sections so they, they appear out of order. Uh, the first proposal, uh, and this is found in sections 1, 4, and 5, clarifies how rental income is treated for MFIP. Uh, current statute contains some contradictory language regarding whether this income should be treated as earned or unearned income. And so section, sections 4 and 5 clarify the MFIP policy of treating rental income as self-employment earned income. And then while we're making that clarification for MFIP, we also make a clarification for CCAP. Um, and so section 1 adds a cross-reference 
to the Minnesota rule that provides additional information about how CCAP treats that income type. Uh, the second proposal, this is in section two, makes a technical update to the definition of family violence in the MFIP statute. Uh, a family violence waiver is essentially a flexibility within the MFIP program um, that a eligibility worker or an employment counselor can issue in the event that a participant is experiencing a, a, a form of uh, de domestic violence or a family violence type situation. And what that waiver does is it just gives that individual a bit more flexibility in their employment plan uh, while they're dealing with that situation. Um, the current definition of family violence includes the infliction of fear of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, or assault. And it's really that word imminent that has apparently caused some confusion among frontline workers. Um, I don't think it's a widespread issue, but there have been some isolated instances where they have taken uh, perhaps a more um, restrictive view of, of that definition or they've um, felt like they had to make a judgment call uh, based on that word. So section two simply deletes that word imminent from the definition to hopefully resolve some of that confusion for frontline workers. And then finally, sections three and six relate to expedited issuance of SNAP benefits. And these are really housekeeping provisions. Uh, there are two sections of statute that contain some outdated and incomplete language uh, when compared to the federal regulations. So we're simply cleaning up uh, some of those provisions from statute. Uh, and with that, I will hand things back to Ms. Sommerfeld to uh, cover Article 4. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, Article 4 is uh, simply a few conforming changes that we need um, to implement a law that was passed last year, making it easier for uh, adult adoptees to access their original birth records. Uh, there were some pieces in statute that were missed. Parts of implementation of that law are go through the Department of Human Services. Some go through the Department of Health. So these are just basically conforming changes. You should have a letter from one of the advocates who was the core, uh, core supporter of the law that was passed last year. We had, uh, uh, we had that gentleman and some other folks review this legislation along with the Department of Health and we haven't had any concerns. So hopefully it's not controversial. And yes, we are going to the judiciary for these. Did you Yay. All right, members, any questions? Uh, Madam Chair, yep. do you want to have, do you want to, Ms. Sommerfeld can talk about what the amendment did. Go ahead. Yeah, my apologies. I should have done that before. Madam Chair, members. Um, so Senator Abler talked about common sense earlier. This just is a big dose of common sense. Um, in Minnesota, it's, although it's going to sound convoluted, in Minnesota, if there is a report of threatened sexual abuse, a local agency must do an investigation. They can't do an assessment. And as part of the investigation, they are to contact the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to obtain information from the Predatory Offenders Registry. And somebody at the BCA recently, probably a lawyer, realized that the statute that the BCA was relying on, and I'm a lawyer, so that's good, um, said that uh, you cannot have the data anymore because it says assessment, not investigation. And we don't do assessments for threatened sexual abuse. So we got caught in this circle of not being able to get the data. So we're making a really quick change here by just adding investigation. Thank you, Ms. Sommerfeld. Questions? Members? Senator Abler. Um, Ms. Sommerfeld, it's always good to work with you. And I know my question will be like, oh, no, they're all great. Uh, is there anything in here that people would consider controversial? Ms. Sommerfeld. Madam Chair and Senator Abler, uh, no. I think everything in here is just fine. <laughs> Largely everything in here is technical. I think the piece that we would have been most concerned about would have been related to the adoption provisions, but we did clarify that with advocates to make sure that those were all okay. Senator Abel. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I accept your answer. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Madam Chair, I don't know. Did Is there another a testifier who wanted to speak about? No. Okay. Did you have any closing comments? No, I didn't. I do not. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the motion is for Senate File 4572 as amended to be recommended to refer to judiciary and to pass. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> huh? Okay. Yep. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The bill is passed. Thank you. On to Senate File 4777. Yes. So uh, we will now move to something completely different. We will talk about another agency, Mincher. And I believe there's this one.
And this bill relates to changing some reporting requirements and also uh, publication of a report date. And I will let my testifier explain the details. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of committee. Um, I'm here presenting on Senate File 4777, Mincher's Policy Bill. At a very high level, Mincher's policy, uh, proposal in this bill would change the timing of our annual report and preliminary budget and change quarterly interagency reporting to an annual report. Um, my name is uh, Erica Helvick Anderson, Senior Director of Public Affairs, um, for the record. Each year, Mincher submits its annual reports to the legislature on January 15th. This report, this report provides the legislature and public with an overview of not only Mincher's operations, but also insight into our, our open enrollment period, which typically runs from November 1st through January 15th in any given year. Mincher also reports its preliminary three-year budget to the Min legislature on March 15th of each year. This proposal will change the due date from Mincher's annual report to legisl legislature from January 15th of each year to the March 31st of each year. Additionally, this bill will change the due date of Mincher's preliminary budget from March 31st to March 15th to March 31st of each year. These changes would allow Mincher to continue to provide an annual update on operations while also allowing Mincher to include a more robust analysis of the entire previous plan year's activities as well as a full accounting of the open enrollment period. This change would also mean that the annual report and preliminary budget are submitted to the legislature at the same time. The Mincher proposals um, would also streamline the interagency reporting requirements to the legislature. Mincher is required to submit quarterly reports to the legislature on its interagency agreements, while other agencies report on the same interagency agreements um, yearly. This proposal will align Mincher's reporting requirements with, um, with different statute, and instead of reporting on interagency inter agreements quarterly, uh, Mincher will submit the interagency agreements report once a year, as the other agencies do. Um, happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? Seeing no questions, Senate File 4777 will be laid over. And we will go on to Senate File 4573. Yeah, 45, uh, Senate File 4573 is a Department of Health uh, policy bill and various health related provisions modifications. Chair, there are some amendments. Did you yeah. want to do those first or after? Should we do, do those yeah. first? Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, the A1 amendment, I believe, is one that uh, provi provides some clarification and um, with some of the DHS. Um, uh, requirements and maybe Mr. Monahan can briefly state what this amendment is conforming conforming language. Mr. Monahan. Madam Chair, members, uh, the A1 uh, is making some conforming changes um, in the nursing facility rates uh, chapter to conform to the changes that were made by the Department of Health in their chapter. Members, any questions about the A1? All right, all those in favor of the A1 say aye. 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 All those opposed? The A1 is amendment. Uh, um, the A2, adopted. I think, is also technical. Okay. Um, Mr. Let's see, Mr. Monahan, did you do the A2 amendment as well? Uh. Madam Chair, <laughs> members, uh, I drafted the A2 on behalf of the Department of Health, so perhaps they can oh. speak to its content. Yep. 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, I'm Lisa Timian. I'm Legislative Director at the Department of Health. And yes, this was just some language to conform with federal CMS language. So just to make clear that uh, Minnesota has an ability that we are into a different option as we transition to our new payment rates in 2025. Members, any questions on the A2? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the A2, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. All those opposed? The A2 is adopted. Did you want to, someone want to talk about the A3? I'll just toss it out there for anybody who wants it. It's more of a... Madam <laughs> Chair, members, um, the A3, I've dubbed the Liam's uh, nitpicking <laughs> amendment. <laughs> Um, since all these statutes were open and in the bill, um, it's mostly grammatical cleanup and rendering terms consistent. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions on the A3? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The A3 is adopted. Madam Chair, to the bill as amended. And I will turn it over to Commissioner. Yes. Cunningham to provide testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Happy to be here with you all again. Uh, this is the first time that I've come before you this session. Uh, and so first, let me just thank you for uh, all the good work that you did and the support of the department last session. We very much appreciate it. And so now we're here again in a busy session to really think about ways through these policy proposals to make sure we uh, protect improve and maintain the health of, of Minnesotans. Our bills are also, our two policy bills are primarily technical, though uh, critically important. Again, as some of the amendments suggest, bringing us into compliance with uh, federal law, clarifying language, removing obsolete language, and in that way, making things easier for Minnesotans. So I will be uh, quick, and we have uh, with me here in the audience a number of our subject matter experts, uh, should you all have, have questions. So to go through, to start, um, in terms of pub the public review process, uh, the first update to the uh, MDH policy bill is to update the process so that we can use email submissions uh, for public comments. That's an effective method for achieving communication and accountability with regulated entities. It's easier, it's more flexible for people, it's more timely. Uh, the next uh, piece on the slide is about our One Health antimicrobial stewardship collaborative, really to help us avoid antibiotic uh, resistance. Uh, this uh, change uh, will let us make sure that the director of that collaborative is a civil servant, just to be really clear that that person is a civil servant and not subject to the political appointee process. That's important uh, for the stability of the program. The next uh, slide speaks to uh, health occupations license and mortuary science application fees as well as body art licensure updates. Uh, this is really to clarify uh, for Minnesotans um, and uh, businesses who are applying one that licensure and application fees are not refundable, um, that if a provisional body art establishment uh, wants to relocate that they must uh, require a new provisional license to do that, and it aligns language, again, getting rid of confusing and obsolete language across statute. The next one is our nursing home case mix review. Again, this is a federal conformity issue. CMS made changes, updates to its payment uh, methods and calculations in October of last year. Um, we just need to be able to uh, come up into compliance with those so that nursing home providers are appropriately reimbursed for the care and services that they provide to their residents. As you all know, we have a, um, a diverse population in Minnesota, a lot of uh, 
uh, new Minnesotans and a lot of folk who were trained as medical providers in their home countries. Um, our international medical graduate program expansion, we like to expand to temporary refugees. Those international medical graduates who have temporary status for humanitarian or public benefit reasons. We like to give them career guidance and support. So when you think about sort of folk who have come to Minnesota for war-torn places like Ukraine, um, this would allow them to think about a career in Minnesota that builds off of their uh, medical training. The next one is our 16C waiver for procurement of contractors to conduct trauma hospital designation reviews. Clearly our trauma hospitals are essential hospitals. Uh, anytime that there is such a life-threatening emergency, they need to be designated and certified. And we rely on providers with that clinical expertise uh, to help us with that work. Uh, these contractors really work for very little, but their clinical expertise is really important, um, and they're committed to the public policy benefits of the state trauma system. Now, their providers, you know, they may be physicians, you know, they're not contractors interacting with our state agencies um, on a regular basis. We want to make the process easy for them and uh, to waive the 16C requirements for this particular uh, type of contractor. Again, we have another uh, federal conformity issue, the nursing home informal appeal revision. This is uh, mostly about definitions. Um, and so um, in both federal and uh, state uh, statutes, uh, there are two types of appeals available to nursing homes. Um, the informal dispute resolution, which is done by the agency, and the independent informal dispute resolution, which is done by an administrative law judge. We just need to make sure we can reconcile uh, the language and clean up the language uh, a, a bit to Im improve clarity. In terms of assisted living and home care licensures, there's a section with a lot of multiple technical sort of updates, a lot of clarifications, um, restricting, for example, the use of the phrase assisted living to when a person or entity is licensed under the chapter, changing the term employee to staff for consistency, clarifying the definition of licensed healthcare professional, clarifying when an assisted living licensee must provide notice to residents of a facility closure, uh, removing references to assisted living in uh, 144A, which talks about home care, not assisted living. So there are a number of just little technical changes that are in that section of the bill. The next, the Office of Medical Cannabis, some legislative changes. We really, um, as we are anticipating the move of the, of the Office of Medical Cannabis, um, we want to make sure we update the process for veterans to enroll uh, in medical cannabis. Veterans are an important uh, population of Minnesotans. They often need and, and request uh, medical cannabis to care for uh, chronic conditions. We want to make sure that uh, their processes uh, facilitate uh, enrollment in the program, uh, which there's some challenges because uh, their VA providers, uh, my understanding, and again, we have subject matter experts, um, can't provide, prescribe something that is illegal at the federal level. So just some updates uh, to make sure veterans can enroll in the medical cannabis uh, program with uh, as much ease as any other Minnesotan. We also change the determination of a qualifying medical condition from annually to every five years. Again, when you look at the medical cannabis qualifying conditions, they're mostly chronic conditions that don't change from year to year. So it makes sense to change uh, the determination um, that the individual still has that condition from annually to every uh, three years. Uh, finally, on this slide, uh, uh, we are requesting repeal of the reporting requirement around ST elevation, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. Um, uh, we understand the, the importance of addressing cardiovascular disease in the state. We understand uh, the importance for, for individuals and families in Minnesota, and yet the data in this space is really inconsistent. It's, it's highly variable, and it's very difficult for our teams to put together highly variable uh, data in a way that provides like accurate, useful uh, ways for us to analyze and make a conclusion. So we're really unable to meet the current statutory requirements for that. 
Um, and so we are happy to engage with uh, those um, in the community, in the health professional community, about how to how to get there better. But right now, um, this is, report is not yielding the information that that it was intended to. So that is the end of that bill. Great. That concludes um, the first bill. Members, question. questions. Senator Abler. Thanks. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Senator. Sorry we haven't connected yet this uh, session. Uh, it may yet happen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just a number of questions, and I appreciate your bill. It's lots of the technical, but maybe I just have to learn a little bit about it. But I wanted to comment on line 12.24 to 29, where you're working on the IMGs, the International Medical Graduates, yeah. and recognizing some of them come for different reasons. Um, are there many of those? I'm, I'm a big supporter of trying to facilitate those. Uh, you, know, you know, some are really highly trained, and some are just going elsewhere to college for their medical school. But can you comment about that? You know? Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for that question in terms of the numbers of international medical graduates that we serve as part of that program. I would ask our health policy team if they have uh, any comment on that can quantify those numbers for us to. Well, to and Madam Chair, just the expansion of it. Just oh. like, what, are there and a the bunch expected of those? Expansion. I just was unaware. It's, it'd be we don't have a number. Nice to accommodate okay. them. Uh, we're going to, we just you know, look back at the audience. We'll get that information, Madam Chair, we'll get that yeah. information to you. Then. Well, it's, a small, it's one of my smaller questions, so I can move on to my next one. Um, Senator Abler. And I was noticing the, the Bill of Rights um, that you're changing, Statement of Rights, um, and, and some are taken away relative to home care, not related to assisted living. Is, are they restated elsewhere for assisted living? Commissioner. Oh, that's on page uh, 16, following to page 18. Madam Chair, if I can have a subject matter expert join us at the table. Welcome. Madam Chair, um, Senator Abler. Uh, yes, there, there are provisions in... Oh, and I'm sorry, I should say my name. I'm Daphne Fonz. I'm um, the Executive Operations Manager for the Assisted Living Home Care Programs with the Department of Health. And yes, there are protections in the Bill of Rights under 144G for assisted living residents. Um, language related to assisted living was removed in uh, various sections that we proposed to just clean up that language and to not make references to assisted living as that's now covered in 144G and not 144A. All right, so, Senator Abler. so Madam Chair, and so all the rights that are removed relative are still exist in 144G for the assisted livings. That's Go what ahead. I'm saying. All right. Okay. I have one more question about, and so but until they were removed, um, there's, there's actually one that's removed that they might like to keep in home care, uh, and that's on line 18.1 where they can place an electronic monitoring device in their resident, um, residence. This was, I remember this discussion, it was very hard fought. I, Representative Johnson worked on it, as I recall, for a long time. We finally got it done. Is there a reason that you wouldn't want to allow a home care person receiving services to have a monitor there? It seems like in those cases, they're even more alone. So Response. Madam Chair, Senator Abler and uh, members, this uh, language is actually removed related to having the uh, electronic monitoring removed in what would now be uh, sleeping accommodations, essentially. Home care is now taking place in the community, is taking a place in the private person's home. It's no longer a requirement of the uh, provider to have the electronic monitoring or have postings or signage about that because they're no longer responsible for that because they no longer own the facility. If you're providing both the sleeping accommodations and the services, you would be assisted living. And so that's also what uh, another of our provisions is clarifying to show that um, in 18.21, looking at that to uh, further clarify that if you have sleeping accommodations, um, you are assisted living, you're not home care. And so that electronic monitoring provision is not necessary um, to place upon the licensee. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, so Madam Chair. So maybe I'm just confusing this with cameras, but there was a, this was very controversial 
And we spent a long time sorting it out, and I had only a tangential bit of it. So if a, if a home care person wants to hang a camera on the wall and or their daughter or somebody wants to, they can still do that. This doesn't change that. Response. Madam Chair and Senator Ehler, this does not do that. No, um, no the, right. pro, the individual is able to put monitoring devices in their home or, or place where they will be residing. Right. Senator Thank Ehler. You. Thank you very much. Um, there's just a lot of stuff here. So, um, okay, we already covered all that. Um, and then um, there was also... Oh, so that, that's, and, and so the 38, on line 17.8, that 30 days notice for assisted living is also in 144G somewhere else. So that's, that's just repeated. That's the 30 days notice for, um, Response. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, this is, this is, again, just removing language that we believe to be duplicative and not necessary any longer, as it's referring to assisted living clients, and those termination protections are in 144G for assisted living residents. And there are also uh, service agreement protections that are in 144A, but it's not necessary. It's not uh, the 144G client residents are now covered under 144G, so it's just removing those references to assisted living. Thank you. Senator and Madam Chair, appreciate it. Um, and so on line 20.23 to 28, um, there's a requirement uh, if you're not getting renewed and you, uh, you appeal, and the, the appeal is the rec reconsideration is denied within 10 days, you have to uh, submit a closure plan. Um, is that a practical amount of time? My question is based on so. Um, You've been denied, but you, you kind of give it the old college try. You try to clean up all the paperwork, and it's still denied. Um, and I realize then they have no license. But is it, if, you're, if you've been like counting on this going, like you had counsel, you're like, here's this thicker packet of stuff. Um, is it, what if they can't come up with it? I mean, at 10 days to close after you've been putting all your effort into a reconsideration. Is that practical that people can do it? Response. In that time? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Abler, uh, this is to give notification to the department, and so we certainly work with um, we certainly work with the licensees on their closure plans, and um, enable them to have communication with us, and uh, really to be able to um, make sure that those residents are transferred safely to the next care setting. And so we realize that takes longer than. 10 days, and part of this is about them giving notification, having communication with the department within that period of time so that we're aware of the closure um, happening, but that we would work with them on a longer period of time until those residents can be safely transferred to another place of care. Senator. Madam Chair, I don't know if this was part of the, uh, the Liam amendments, but I, I think that you want to say it different. Because um, I says it must submit a closure plan. To me, that seems like a kind of a complete plan. Um, and I think you just want to say it. Nobody asked. This is just spontaneous on my part. But it seems like you want to make it clear that this is not the final plan. They just that, that enter into to agreement to establish a closure plan or something like that. I think would that's that's what you're meaning. Because when this stuff is going south, you're not going to be here eight years from now, and they're going to be like, "What is your plan?" Like, hey, we can't give you one. And now you're getting fined and whatever. So does that make sense? It's fine. It's uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abel, yes, sir, that makes sense. So you oh. just, if you could think about rewording that, that would be okay. productive. And then I noticed they also protect the term on line 2014, assisted living. Is that new? Response. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, this is, um, Yes, this is new language to help clarification for providers as well as consumers. Uh, we have several f f um, home care providers that currently still have uh, assisted living in their names, um, even nursing home in their names, and this is to help uh, give a timeline for folks to be able to work towards clarifying that they aren't in assisted living or they're not a nursing home um, within the name that they uh, advertise to the community. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, no one came to testify with concerns about this, and I imagine the people that are doing this, but there's some people that are really little, but I'm glad you're giving them some time. Um, and then, um, 
So are these considered controversial things? Or, I mean, they're not to you, you're the department. Hey, it seems good to us. Um, but I just, if anybody is concerned, I wish they would just talk to me if they're concerned. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. And then my last question, Madam Chair. Um, did Ms. Bonds or the Commissioner want to oh. respond to that at all? Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my understanding um, from talking to, to the team, talking to our legislative director, uh, Ms. Timian, is that these changes have been talked through with the impacted sort of stakeholders. Um, and, and these changes provide clarity uh, for them um, and, for, and for us. Uh, to, the, to the plan comment, I think that is just to say, you've got you've to think about how we're going to get your residents to a safe place now that you have to close. And so just show us that you're thinking about and putting together some ideas within that 10-day period about how we're going to move forward to safely care uh, for folks who are currently residing in your facility. Uh, okay, thank well, you, Commissioner. I was going to let you. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam uh, And I will also add that this bill will go to Human Services, where we can talk about assisted living for hours. If, if you so choose. <laughs> so keep that in mind. So, Madam Chair, just Senator I'll, I'll just have a comment. So I, on line 20.27, 20, 20. we can discuss this elsewhere, but you might want to insert the, ter the word draft in front of closure, a draft closure plan, just to kind of, if you mean it to be incomplete and you're okay with it incomplete, just, we'll talk about that elsewhere. My final question, um, and uh, on line 18.21, uh, that home licensee must not provide sleeping accommodation as a, as a provision of home care services. And why would you want to deny that opportunity in the rare case that might make sense? Response. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, um, the current definition in 144G with assisted living is that if you provide sleeping accommodations and services, that you are by the definition an assisted living provider. And so this is providing clarification now that really has changed since August 1st, 2021 with the implementation of assisted living, that home care providers truly are agencies that go into the home, which could be into an assisted living residence to provide care, but they are no longer the landlord. They are no longer providing the sleeping sleeping accommodation to the resident. And if you are doing so and providing the services, you would then need an assisted living license. Senator Abler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your answer. Okay. You. Other questions, members? Okay, seeing none, did you have any final comments, Madam Chair? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so um, Senate File 4573, the motion is uh, as amended. Recommended to pass and be re referred to human services. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, the bill passes. Next up, we have Senate File 4860. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 4860 is a Department of Health policy bill that relates to vital record provisions, modifications, and I will turn it over to Commissioner Cunningham for a testimony. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, this is our vital records bill. There are four proposals included in this bill to provide clarity to our vital records process in Minnesota. Um, the first, ensuring timely birth registration for safe place infants. Um, we are a state that allows uh, birth uh, parents to relinquish uh, care of their children uh, to safe places when they do not feel uh, that they are able to take care of the child. Um, current law does not address how to establish a birth record for those children. And so this would standardize the process, prevent errors, and prevent duplication. Um, it will authorize replacement of any previously established record and waive the record replacement fee and remove delays in the permanent placement of infants with their adoptive parents. Uh, that happens um, not infrequently uh, where the birth record is the impediment or slows down the adoptive process uh, for infants who are relinquished through the slave place uh, statute. The next one is clarifying how you update our vital records. 
um, MDH can correct, amend, or replace vital records. Those are three different uh, processes. Um, and it clarifies, it provides definitions to clarify the difference between a correction, an amendment, and a replacement. Um, and it updates the statute language um, to help courts, the, our program, and individuals um, maintain updated vital records. The next one is removing obsolete uh, reasons for replacing a birth record. Um, this clause eliminates subsequent marriage as a basis for changing the birth record. This is obsolete language. We have not included marital status on birth records for over 20 years. Um, so we can remove that. The final uh, one, which I um, I'll read more uh, closely, is um, about Minnesota Father's Adoption Registry. Uh, so in Minnesota, a man who believes he is the father of a child but is not married to the mother can register with the Minnesota Father's Adoption Registry. The registry is for men who have not established paternity in court or with a voluntary acknowledgement form. Men registered in the Minnesota Father's Adoption Registry are notified if the child is in the process of being adopted. So searching MFAR for putative fathers is a requirement of every adoption in the state. Now, current law authorized certain individuals to search the MFAR registry, uh, birth mothers and their attorneys, adoption supervisors, child support and social services representatives. Currently, putative fathers and stepfathers petitioning for adoption are not allowed to request a search. And so they have to go through a more cumbersome, costly process to actually search, even if it's just to sort of check that their details are accurate, uh, but to search the registry. So this change would allow men who have registered to request an MFAR search for themselves without requiring them to obtain a court order. It also allows fathers who are petitioners and step-parent adoptions involving their children, for example, if the, if the other parent has become deceased or their parental rights are terminated, uh, the legal father, uh, this would allow the legal father who is a step-parent uh, to search and provide proof to the court of the required MFAR search, making it easier uh, for fathers. Thank you. Members question, Senator Abler. Oh, that was reflex, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. For my colleague, Senator Kupak. Thank you. Senator that's, Kupak. That's funny. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in, in our packet here, there, there is a, a letter uh, about a request of an amendment to this bill, uh, specifically as it uh, relates to uh, original birth records for abandoned newborns, making those records unavailable to the registrant except by a court order. And I know last year we passed legislation to uh, allow you know, children who were adopted to get their birth records later on. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, person was wondering if there was possibly an amendment to this bill to allow that, or just curious what the response is, if there's a reason for that or not, or? Anybody at the table? Do you wanna come? Yeah. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Lisa Timian, Legislative Director at MDH. Um, I would defer to our vital records uh, registrar, Molly Crawford, who's here. But my understanding is that um, the suggested amendment would kind of eliminate the structure around the Safe Place um, for Newborns Act um, and allowing the uh, identity to remain private. Senator Kubek. Sure, I just wanted, you know, because I don't think this would probably take effect till they were 18 or so, and I, and I think you know, going forward, obviously, as you get older, you have, you know, questions, health concerns, things you might want to know, try to find out. Um, I don't know if that there's a way to accommodate that or not, but just. Did you want to work on some language? Possibly, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Seeing none. Uh, any final comments, Senator McClendon? Uh, no, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, it Seems like if if it would be possible to look into whether language could be drafted, that would be um, helpful. Maybe Senator Kupak could look into that with the department, um, so that you know when children are 18 and over, you know that they would have could possibly have access. So, okay. But I don't have any other comments. No, thank you. 
So the motion is for Senate file 4860 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to judiciary where dreams go to die. All those in favor <laughs> signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Uh, the bill passed. Passes. It's passed. Thank you. And we can and, adjourn. Um, oh, oh, not yet. Oh, I was just going to say, Madam Chair, that um, please, on your way out, um, the Ms. Timian has provided uh, goodies, so and there's some fruit Ooh. over there, so you can pick up for the road. Thank so, you very thank much. You. And with that, we are happily adjourned. See you in like 12 hours. Thank you. <laughs>